And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up. NSF live stream. Today is a pretty exciting one as it is the first launch of SpaceX's bandwagon program, uh, which we'll get more into here in a sec. It's also exciting because it is another RTLS landing, so the booster will be coming back to land at landing zone one. I see all of your five by fives in chat. Thank you very much for that. And with me, I am not alone, thankfully. Joining us today is Alex. Alex, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. This is just, you know, more. It, it's it's I think the fourth launch of the month, and and it's the eighth. It's it, well, the eighth for me. I, I'm sorry. It is the eighth for me. It is the seventh local. Like, man, this is so crazy, right? I'm I'm super excited for for another Falcon 9 launch. Yay! <laughs> yeah, right. This is SpaceX's 35th mission of the year. And it's only the world's 67th orbital launch attempt. So SpaceX has over half of all orbital launches so far this year, which is just crazy. And also joining us today, bringing us these views, is Julia. Julia, how's it going? Why, hello there. Um, it's going wonderful. I am out at Cars Park today. And it is probably the last weekend in Central Florida that we will not have humidity and high temps. So I'm very much enjoying sharing lunch with y'all. Awesome. Yeah, we'll go back to this view Julia's bringing us in a sec, because I think we'll be lucky enough to get a tour. Um, but also joining us today is Sawyer. Sawyer, how are you doing? I am doing pretty good right now. I'm out at Jetty Park, uh, which is pretty close to landing zone one which is hopefully where the booster will end up in just a little bit from now. Uh, but I hope everyone joins me in jumping on the pun bandwagon for this mission. <laughs> yeah, that has been the pun of this whole launch. And with that, if you guys have any questions for us, make sure you tag us in chat with at NASA Spaceflight, and that'll put it into some fancy software that we have, so we'll hopefully be able to ask that to our co-hosts. But with that, Alex, could you give us an overview of today's mission? Yeah, so today's mission is going to be the first of the bandwagon type of missions. This is a sort of a new thing that SpaceX is rolling out. And, you know, you may remember that SpaceX has its own small sat rideshare program. And that small sat rideshare program, um, you know, they, they have these transport missions that they have launched both from the Cape and also uh, from Vandenberg much more lately. They have done 10 missions of those, but now they have a new type of mission. So transport missions, um, they go to sun-synchronous orbits. Those are a type of polar orbits are, are essentially in such a way their their, their inclination re relative to the equator and their altitude is such that they always are an intelligence uh, a person and you want to see and spy other people. but. Today, bandwagon one, it is a type of different mission. Bandwagon missions go to mid-inclination orbits. This one in particular is going to 45 degree inclination, essentially a little bit lower inclination than the ISS, if you think about that. And <clears throat> because of that, it is launching to the Northeast. It will not hug the, co the coast of the United States. It's not that high inclination, but it will go Northeast at a departure from you know the starting missions that we see from the Cape that go to the southeast. And as you can see there, it contains 
a bunch of of payloads here. There's there's at least eleven payloads um, on the on this mission. Um, there are the, the the top one I, I should say is probably the project uh, 425 Flight Two. That is the second satellite under South Korea's uh, newest reconnaissance uh, satellite program, which is essentially you know a a, a set of five different uh, satellites that are. Uh, going to be deployed in different uh, inclinations. It's a it's a constellation of satellites, of so five satellites. SpaceX already flew one of them in December, um, and that one flew to a sun synchronous orbit. This one is going to be launching into this mid inclination orbit, just as I mentioned before, which is essentially the target of bandwagon missions. It is probably the the, the heaviest satellite on this uh, payload stack. It is about 800 kilograms. Um, and it is probably on the top. We don't have any pictures of it though, because it is a classified satellite. So uh, for that for for that matter, I think SpaceX is not even going to cover the the second stage flight. So yeah, um, we cannot show any pictures of here's how the the satellites look like or anything like it, because unfortunately they have not released that that kind of picture. So this this satellite that that is going to be launching for for South Korea, that is a synthetic aperture radar satellite. It's actually not the first of all of these uh, satellites that is like that. That is essentially using radar to be able to image things on the ground. You probably know about this if you watch this week in spaceflight. We talk about some of these satellites launching every now and then. It's sort of the new uh, trend of launching a bunch of these. And in fact, as I was saying, there's another two at least uh, that are like that, uh, which are the QPSR7 uh, from IQP, uh, IQPS. <laughs> that is another SAR satellite. And then Capella Space is fly flying the Capella 14. That is another SAR satellite, essentially synthetic aperture radar satellites, those are at least three of all the 11 spacecraft. Another thick satellites are going to be from Hawkeye's 360. Uh, those are essentially like two trios of satellites that are going to be launched. And they are sort of like uh, radio frequency communications and like detection of, of uh, of, of signals from other satellites and, on, on, and devices. And so they're sometimes used as signal intelligence satellites as well, uh, but they are commercial, they are not military. And then the other two that I'm looking here, they are uh, Centauri 6, which is a 12 cubes, a 12 unit quick, uh, CubeSat for Internet of Things. It's a small CubeSat essentially, uh, not really that big. And then another one, which is TSAT 1A, it's an Earth observation satellite, so that'll go also on this bandwagon mission. So we have 11 satellites, all of them going to this mid-inclination orbit, around 600 kilometers, uh, we think, maybe distributed in different uh, orbits, we'll see, after they they track all of these in orbit. But that's definitely what they are doing, what SpaceX is doing for today. But that's for the payload. There's more things going on. Yeah, indeed there are. And it's worth highlighting that right, the payload mass on this mission is only what on the order of 13 to 1500 kilograms something like that and they're going yeah. to a relatively low orbit so that's why the falcon has more than enough performance to do the rtls um when in comparison the like what starlink payloads mm. mass nowadays is like 16 and a half tons or so it's like 10 times more with a starlink in fact yeah. we think and there's like a, a huge chance that we're going to see a stubby nozzle today uh, which is bad since Max is not here. I can I can claim that. Stubby not so bad. <laughs> so we'll keep an eye on that once once that MVAC engine ignites. I don't think we're gonna get any any views from SpaceX from the second stage, but we will probably be able to see like from the interest stage and everything. It always looks different when it, there's a stubby right. nozzle in there. So yeah, we'll 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 take a look at that once once we get to that point. But we expect that to to be uh, on on this mission again. So as you were saying, it's probably 1300 1400 kilograms not more than that just adding up and even if you account like the mass of the of the dispenser it's probably not more than two tons going to orbit so yeah yeah but thankfully um even though the second stage may have a stubby nozzle um thankfully the first stage doesn't and this will be the 10th booster to reach 14 flight sawyer could you give us a bit of an overview of it only 14 flights. This is young and 
By the way, apologies if you could hear the breezy wind, but it's been a breeze for Booster 1073, as you mentioned, on his 14th flight. This has flown uh, Starlink 4 15, SES 22, Starlink 4 26, Starlink 4 35, Hakuta R Mission 1, Amazonas Nexus, CRS 27 to the ISS. Uh, Starlink 6-2, 5-11, 6-12, 6-27, 6-37, and 6-41, which interestingly about that, it has only been just under 34 days since that 6-41 mission and it last flew. So a very fast 33-day, 23-hour turnaround on that. And while it will be landing at landing zone one, which is just a couple miles from where I am at the moment, they're still going to try and recover the fairings, of which Doug is already out at sea recovering the fairings from the previous Starlink mission, chugging its way north to try and get the fairings from this mission as well. Yeah, that's one of the cool things about these new fairing recovery vessels. Both Bob and Doug can actually carry two full set of payload fairings, um, so they're able to fit four uh, onto the deck, which is pretty impressive. Um, anyway, I see a few people in chat wondering, like, where are Max? Where is D? Um, and they are going out for the solar eclipse. So tomorrow, NSF will have l a live stream um, of the solar eclipse. We have many, many people stationed all across the U.S. Um, and we'll bring coverage from all the way in Texas to what, Maine, I think, is kind of where... I, I'm not entirely sure where we have people stationed. I wasn't involved in the planning, <laughs> but we have people everywhere. It's like, I think I saw something that we have like 42 camera views. Yeah. Um, so that's where they are. Make sure you tune in tomorrow. As you can see, a lot of the Cape people are not actually at the press site. That's a very empty press site compared to how it normally is for these launches. Um, but with that... Julia, can you tell us a little bit about where you are watching from today? Well, I sure can. And I can tell you that I can tell there are people traveling for the eclipse because launch viewing seems just a little bit quieter, even with, with spring break. But today I am at Cars Park, which is one of the KSC recreational areas. Um, they open up this park for the public for viewing for only five dollars a car and i might give you guys a little bit of a tour of what you can see from here um as you can see we've got 39a and that is the farthest north you're going to see from the fishing pier but if pan around a little bit we go from 39a and we'll get to see 41 which is the atlas and Vulcan, and soon to be Starliner pad. And then let's see what else we can find. Shouldn't be too far away from, let's see, just a little bit more. There is Launch Complex 40, and you can see the, the newer crew tower, which we got great views of the new egress system there. Um, panning a little bit more, maybe with my zoom, we can see a Delta IV Heavy on the pad. Let's see. I don't want to give anybody whiplash here. But there is the pad that our CAPE team will be coming back from the eclipse and broadcasting from in a few more days, the long-awaited final flight of Delta IV Heavy. And the other things you can see from here are pretty cool. Um, this is a view of, we're almost there. This is the industrial area of the 45th Space Wing. So when we talk about 45th Delta, this is kind yeah. of the prime area. And then I've got one more view to share with you guys. And if you ever come to visit when Blue Origin starts launching, look at this. We are almost there. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> look at that, guys. There we go. Look at how big wow. that hip is. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So um, I sometimes have people pop into my messages and ask me, where's the best place to watch a launch? And it's complicated. Uh, there isn't exactly a bad place to watch a launch pretty much anywhere along the coast here. But if you are coming to see something 
question, I would suggest Cars Park or Jetty Park, where Sawyer is right now. In a launch like today, well, you have a lot of options. If you want to be by the launch itself, you can go to Playa Linda Beach, and you are just, oh gosh, maybe two miles away from that pad. Um, but if the landing is more important to you, then you can go to Jetty Park or Port Canaveral. So check out that video that we made to give you some ideas and feel free to message any of us here on the Space Coast and we're happy to help you have a great launch experience. It was funny because we were showing the video as you were talking and you were on the video as well. So <laughs> it seems like you are the one <laughs> talking through live. <laughs> yeah, some our... of what I just said might sound familiar. <laughs> Yeah, our CAPE team did great work with that video. Um, we'll make sure to put the link in chat for those of you who may not have seen it. Um, yeah, as Julia was talking about, as she was showing the Delta IV Heavy Pad, um, that launch is currently scheduled for Tuesday uh, at 12.53 p.m. local. So let's all cross our fingers and hope that Delta IV Heavy is able to launch for that final time. Anyway. Let's go back to today's launch of Bandwagon. Um, I see some questions in chat, so just as a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions, uh, make sure you tag us in chat with that at NASA Spaceflight. Um, Julia, here's one for you. Uh, Byers, um, Byers Dofer is asking, do you think we will see a jellyfish on tonight's launch? Hmm. Hmm. I think we are oh I think we are just a little bit too much before sunset tonight to get that jellyfish. Um but the sun is it's getting lower by now. So will we have maybe that traditional what you're thinking, that really glowy jellyfish? No. But what we will have is a wonderful view of the uh, boost back and that alone actually gives us some neat interaction um in the plumes. So uh, spectacular glowy jellyfish maybe not but we're still going to get an rtls sort of jellyfish and we may have the potential afterwards for the noctilescent clouds where the sun is just low enough that the plume right before the sun sets gets these really cool colors yeah there you can see that trajectory one thing that i do wonder is um since it is close to sunset because it is not after sunset which will create the jellyfish it is before, but it is, but it is uh, close enough that you may have like redness and like oranges, uh, you know, tones on on the plume. I don't know. I'm really now looking forward to to that launch. Now I'm more excited mm -hmm. for it. Yeah, because it always looks beautiful when when those things happen. Yeah, and Alex is wondering the same thing. A different Alex is wondering the same thing mm -hmm. with the super chat. So Alex, thank you very much for your support and. Um, apparently, you got to see the Vandy launch last night all the way from New Mexico. That is impressive. I'm kind of jealous. Um, Coco Cat gifted a Red Team membership. If you got that, make sure you thank them. And then Steve uh, is wondering, here's a good one for you, Sawyer. Why do some launch pads have lightning towers and others don't? No. Well, they all have uh, different lightning mechanisms. So for some of them, again, you've got the catenary wires, which is what you're used to seeing with, you know, the four towers at something like Slick 40. Uh, it, if you look at those launch pads, uh, when it lifts off, especially at night, you can see it. It basically launches through this square of wires, and those are what take any lightning that might hit it and spread it out and away from the rocket. Whereas something like 39A, which you have here, you see that big white mast on the top. That kind of coils around it and disperses the lightning away from that. So it really just depends on how the pad is built. Yeah. And if you're on Vandenberg, you probably will not see one of these towers. Or what you will see is like some kind of other type of of tower because one misconception that i see a lot is that these towers for example the mass that you see there at, at 39a that is uh like the lightning rod or something like that it you know that lightning hits that and that is essentially what it does what it does is actually it holds the cables that then protect and sort of forms this this sort of um kind of i don't know cape it's it's a bit of a of an irony i'm not doing any pumps here mm -hmm. but it kind of 
you know, en en engulfs and protects the, the rocket from all of that uh, electricity, right? And so uh, when you see those, those rays, those lightning bolts, uh, you know, suddenly, you know, hitting something in the air near the rocket, and you're like, oh, it nearly missed the, the rocket. It's like, yeah, but it hit the, those wires that go down. And as Sawyer was mentioning, sometimes what you have is like four of them, and you have them all create like a like a boxy kind of thing up up top and that that protects the rocket or you can just have one or two or three uh that essentially just do like for example at lc39 uh, mb they have three for example but it does the same the same thing yeah, yeah. faraday cage style as yeah. tmw was, <laughs> was mentioning very cool yeah it's a good question of it's all about engineering decisions of what works best for that specific launch pad. And, you know, if you're in an area that doesn't have much lightning, do you even need one? Um, so that's all the decisions that they make. But with that, we have crossed the T minus 38 minute mark. So at this point, the launch director should have verified that they're go for propellant load if they are on track for today's launch. So we'll be making sure to pay attention for that, which is should begin here in about a minute and 43 seconds with RP1 load on both stages and stage one liquid oxygen load. Um, so we'll get confirmation of that as we start seeing frost on the vehicle and perhaps a post on X from SpaceX about um, that being go for launch. Um, and apparently I'm being told that we have a launch audience that has started to gather that we're able to show you guys. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> the entire pier is full of people waiting to see the vehicle lift off here in 35 minutes. And land. They're going to have a good view of the landing. Yeah. I, right, I went to Jetty Park about two years ago for an RTLS landing that, of course, got scrubbed. Um, but it was pretty surreal to see all of this. And I def I need to go back down. I want to go back down. Anyway, back yeah, because when you, of oh, but the problem is, I, I should say, don't go when there's an RTLS, because then we will not have the RTLS on time. Because the last time you went <laughs> down there, there were two RTLSs, you missed both. Yeah, I missed. I somehow managed to scrub three missions, and I was there for like five days. <laughs> yeah, that was that yeah. Was some I have mixed bad luck. I have mixed feelings about you visiting again. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. <laughs> uh, I still love you, though. You're welcome anytime. Yeah, one one day when school is less of a problem, I need to visit all you Cape folk again, see a launch, and then I can finally be like, it's so cool. You guys on uh, watching should come and witness this. But, um, Alex, sod this give me a b is wondering uh will they fully fuel the rocket given the payload size or lack thereof yeah they always they always fully fuel the rocket uh for for these missions mostly because it it's a consistent thing to always like especially <laughs> there's, there's something that I, that I will I will talk about later uh but essentially when you have a consistency on your flights and you don't deviate that much or you only deviate but you deviate within correct boundaries you essentially are keeping all your all of your data within the same regime and so what that means is that when you compare them then you're comparing against similar uh, similar data essentially so if there's anything out of family as it, as it, as it is usually uh, called then you can pinpoint that because you're like oh yeah that one that one had uh, uh, a little bit of a of a bad issue here the mission went well but you know that one we will need to to look at that um, sometimes those things happen you know like you have a mission that looks completely normal then you go through the data and it's like oops well uh, there was this little thing going on 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 there that we we need to to tweak here and there. I said that that is mostly uh, what is done for customer missions, but for example, Starlink missions they have their own sort of requirements, their own risk uh, approach. 
This one might be a little bit like that, but instead of defueling or like not fueling as much, they actually fill the rocket with more fuel, with more propellant uh, in general, trying to squeeze more performance out of uh, Falcon 9. So essentially what you get is the opposite. You get more propellant and, and essentially they build up this sort of data that is, that is just from Starlink missions and that eventually leads them to, to be able to tweak other missions that may not use the same performance uh, capabilities, but can benefit from the lessons learned from, from Starlink missions. And so, for example, we're going to have an RTLS mission today on a very easy flight for Falcon 9. It's barely above one ton to orbit. But for Dragon missions, it's carrying 13 tons or so to, to low Earth orbit, which is a lot. And it is right on the edge of, of what is a lot of what is you know, of what Falcon 9 can do uh, with RTLS, but still they were able to squeeze a little bit of performance and being able to do that RTLS back. And so what that all trans translates into is that today, for example, we expect them to carry a, a short MVAC nozzle, essentially the, the stubby nozzle uh, design, which will eventually mean that they are saving money on this mission because they are not having the more expensive long nozzle. It's hideous, uh, like it, it doesn't look well, but it saves money, so okay, whatever. Yeah, and I see a few people asking in chat, um, does, like Gareth is asking, does the stubby nozzle have the disposable ring uh, like the new design? Uh, no, the stubby nozzle does not have that ring stiffener on it, and I believe never has. Um, but what they're alluding to, if you guys may not have been paying super close attention to the recent Starlink missions is the ring stiffener that used to go around the MVAC engine nozzle at the very end uh, has been removed from a lot of missions recently. And, you know, we don't have a super good reason for that from SpaceX, but we can assume they just found that it was unnecessary, so thought, let's just get rid of it. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, let's see, do we see any signs of fueling yet? I don't, but any second now we should start seeing frost on that liquid oxygen tank. Looks like maybe there's a little. It's kind of hard to tell. I think tell. There's, there's also like the shadow of the tower <laughs> that is messing with the view. Yeah, yeah, pay attention to, what, about a third of the way up, the Falcon 9 booster. Um... Uh, kind of oh. where the light begins is I'm where I'm starting to to see condensation. Yeah, they're definitely into into propellant load. I can see some condensation. Yeah, awesome. So that means they are on track for liftoff in half an hour. So with that, Alex, you said you have some fun statistics you were hoping to share with all of our viewers. <laughs> fun statistics. Yeah. Um. There you can see a little bit of a cloudiness, so to speak, there at the bottom of the liquid oxygen tank. It's essentially where the triangle part of the of the transport director ends, just a, a tad bit higher than that. You can see some clouds already forming there on the booster. That is because it's cold. Yeah. Um, so there's, the, there's an interesting stat that... So first of all, if it lands back on land at LC1, this is going to be the 40th landing at LC1, so that is a, a, a nice round number. But there's also, um, I mean, well, there's also another round number that I'm looking here through my stats, 80th launch uh, from LC39A. But if you remember, I was talking about, you know, loading propellant and how they want to keep everything, you know, in, in the same kind of range so that they are able to compare and everything. You know, that is because there's always problems when you change your propellant load sequence. And they found that out the hard way on September 1st, 2016 with the MO6 uh, mission. They were doing a pre-launch static fire test, but eight minutes before the static fire happened, the second stage exploded. And they found out that, you know, through a long and, and arduous task of looking through all the data that it was just down to how they were loading the propellant and how they were loading helium on board they you know that, that was at least part of the cause it was also because there were buckles on the on the copvs the composite overwrap pressure vessels on the second stage and so they solved both by changing the the propellant load sequence and helium load sequence 
but also the, the, the design of the COPVs. So what does that mean for this mission? Well, 300 launches after that, we are here on Bandwagon 1. It will be the 300th orbital launch of Falcon 9 or a Falcon rocket in general, Falcon Heavy included, since that failure. So that will be 300 launches that SpaceX has done with the Falcon family without any failure. And of course, we hope and we are expecting today's mission to be also another successful mission as it's been traditional. But that just, it's like, you know, 300. It's incredible. There's no other rocket. If you look at any other family, Long March, Soyuz, whatever, they, they don't come even close to this streak of successful launches. It is amazing. Yeah, then also uh, at least a factor of 10, this will be the 220th consecutive Falcon 9 landing, or Falcon landing. landing. So um, just goes to show the the pace and the success rate of Falcon is truly mind-blowing at this point. Um, let's see, a little bit more support. Um, Marty gifted a Red Team membership, and then Bideford, a regular on stream, says, Can everyone please like NSF tonight? Thank you, Trevor, Alex, Sawyer, and Julia for covering this launch. <laughs> Thank you, Bideford, for always being around and um, asking people to support even if they can't monetarily with a like which does help a ton so thank you everyone for just being here even if you can't do that we don't want um everyone to think that they must super chat or anything like that uh it's just those who choose to go above and beyond we appreciate but we appreciate everyone so thank you very much and then jerwa another regular just gifted 10 red team memberships i see people getting those in chat so um Make sure you thank him. Um, going back to some questions, um, I've seen one more thing about this kind of bandwagon mission, Alex, is how many launches do we expect bandwagon to have compared to transporter? All right, we know we have these transporter missions roughly quarterly. Can we expect a similar cadence for bandwagon? Well, bandwagon will be a little bit less often. Uh, do you can see some more condensation and already some some hints of frost there as well on the booster. But yeah, uh, so for 2024 at least, we're gonna have four transporter missions. I believe there's so we have had already transporter 10. Uh, I'm trying to look through all of the this stuff here. We had transporter 10. We have transporter 11, 12, and 13 this year and then um oh wait no transporter 13 was already moved to 2025 never mind three transporter missions in 2024 and two bandwagon missions so essentially we're gonna have uh transporter 11 is coming up this summer i believe and then 12 is in in the fall and bandwagon 2 will be in the fall and i believe the transporter missions are being kept uh, at Vandenberg, while the bandwagon missions are so far still here from the Cape, I don't know if they can even <clears throat> launch from from Vandenberg to these mid inclinations. I know that they could, but will they want to do that? We'll find out. But for now, bandwagon missions from the Cape and uh, transporter missions from Vandenberg, and they're going to be keeping that. You know, three transporter missions in 2025, two bandwagon missions in 2025. 2026, also three transporter, two bandwagon so far. That is how uh, they're planning that. I'm looking forward to the day that we have something like, instead of going to low Earth orbit, it's a small sat right share program where, you know, a, a type of mission that, that goes to maybe GTO or maybe it goes to the moon or something like that. I'm really looking forward to, to that moment where, you know, we have a lot of payloads going even beyond low Earth orbit. Yeah, and it is probably worth kind of talking about how this was largely or this orbit was largely fulfilled um, by rocket lab before at least for smaller satellites um, a lot of their missions went to approximately this inclination so um, this is just yet another uh, example of some competition coming to that um, small sat space that hopefully allows for satellites to go into orbit for even cheaper because who doesn't love competition and it's um, worth even pointing out that Capella Space so far has launched every single one of their sets 
on the Electron from Rocket Lab. This is the mm-hmm. first time that they're launching on something other than Electron. Yeah, and and even one of the other satellites launched recently on Electron. Uh, well, not satellites, the, like the companies. Uh, key, uh, boy, Q. PSR7, so they launched another one uh, recently on Electron as well, I think it was in December, and, and now they're launching on, on, on Falcon 9. So there's, there's obviously this sort of thing of transporter and now bandwagon missions is starting to, to steal some of these payloads from, from small sat launchers. If you think about it, up until bandwagon was around, when you wanted to have a low inclination mission, right? You went to small sat launchers like Electron or, well, Electron and maybe Alpha, but Alpha is not launching at, at the scale right now that it probably will, you know, you, you will think of that as your go-to for for launching to mid-inclination. Now you have bandwagon. That's that's how SpaceX goes. So maybe in the future, if there's a lot of payloads going to other orbits, they're going to be doing other types of missions. I wouldn't be surprised if they were to do that. And you know, maybe one day we'll we'll see the same on Starship. Yeah, and Sawyer, um, I know you love answering this question. So, real quick, before we get to the T-minus twenty-minute vent, um, nine eight central is wondering why does the water tower vent on some launches, referring to sometimes the flow that comes out of that water tower that you can see on your screen. Yeah, the big one at thirty-nine A. A lot of times, kind of. Um leaking out the side that is totally normal again that uh, is a very full water tower and it takes quite a bunch of water that they use for those rainbirds uh at the base of the pad so if you see that it's just kind of basically relieving pressure inside the big water tank before it's then used to help uh control things a little bit at the base of the rocket and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is behavior that we also saw back in the shuttle program from launches at 39A, correct? Did someone say shuttle? Uh, I mean, yes, that is correct. <laughs> we brought it up, so now Chris is happy. And you're happy. Mark the bingo cards. Yeah. But Sawyer, we are coming up in about 30 seconds to that T-20 minute and 20 second vent. Could you explain to everyone what exactly is this vent? Why is it important? What does it signify? Absolutely. So as we talk about the T-minus 20-minute, 20 20-second 20 vent, we like to call it best vent. Uh, that is basically purging one of the fueling lines that helps fuel the second stage of Falcon 9 uh, ahead of the next propellant. So whereas the first stage loads the liquid oxygen and the RP-1, which is the rocket, propellant one refined form of kerosene simultaneously the second stage starts with the rp1 that vent usually means that rp1 load is complete they'll clean out the lines which takes about four minutes and then as soon as that vent stops that typically means that second stage liquid oxygen load has begun very good and any second now we should be seeing that perhaps the um Sometimes the second, the exact seconds aren't published ahead of time. So uh, as yeah. soon as we see that vent, we will know that we are 20 minutes and 20 seconds away from flight. I think we're finding out right now that it's probably not going to be 16.00. So we're probably going to have to to adjust that. Yeah, it's worth noting that we did not get... Oh, there we, there go. we go. So... It sh- looks like it is sixteen forty, if my or f- forty 50. or fifty. Fifty. Fifty yeah. because it came at thirty, so yeah, it's it's fifty. Well, time to adjust the clock. <laughs> yeah, so for those who may be wondering, right, on Starlink launches and also I believe some of the transporter missions, we receive TLEs uh f- or T Celez track and other agencies like that are provided. Uh, with TLEs, which stands for two-line element sets. I don't exactly know where that name comes from, but what those are is they let all of the satellite operators know there will be satellites placed into this orbit at this time. So that's when we know all of the T-zeros that are available for SpaceX, and we know the exact deploy time uh, down to the microsecond, if I remember correctly. Um, but since this is a, has a classified payload on board, we will not re- receive such t- um, data from today's launch. 
Uh, and that's also why we actually are not even seeing any second stage camera views on today's launch, or we're not expecting to see any second stage camera views. Um, awesome. Here's an interesting question from uh, Xander the Space Nerdus. Why don't they just put some Starlink satellites on top uh, instead of having so much wasted thrust with a mission that is this easy for Falcon? Well, today's mission is not going to one of the orbits for Starlink, so that's the, the, the main problem. When transporter missions were launching, if you remember, I think it was transporter 1 and 3, they carried Starlink satellites, but they were going to an actual orbit of Starlink, but it was the first constellation of Starlink, uh, which was essentially like uh, Shell 3, where they were launching to to. Uh, 97 degrees inclination or something like that. 90, I think it's 96.7 in, you know, to be more precise. But essentially, that is why they were they were able to carry those. Also, they were the older version, the uh, V1.0 version uh, of a Starlink. The V2 minis, I'm not sure if they will ha they, they could have like an adapter on it, especially with today's mission, because today's mission, the the Project 425 uh, satellite. That satellite is probably on the top of the of of the payload stack, and so that that will mean that you will need essentially the, the Starlink satellites will have to be all the way at the bottom, and you will have to eject the the adapter or something like that into low Earth orbit. The altitude is also not the same as these Starlinks. Like it's just a, ma a, a, a mess. It's it's super like completely different orbit, different arrangement of payloads and things like that. It's also the the V2 Starlink uh, satellite, the, the V2 mini version. So I'm not even sure if they can do that uh, with this version to carry ride shares like that. Um, it will be interesting because you know one of the one of the actual things that I think might be the the what what prompted bandwagon missions is that probably. With the V2 mini satellites, they cannot put a stack of other satellites on top of those. That's my total guess, though, that that it just cannot fit with the new, uh, you know, the new rods that uh, don't fully deploy. They're just being kept and everything. That has been at least one of my guesses as to why we didn't see any right chairs on Starlink missions. Um, Whereas, you know, with V1.5s, we did see those uh, up until essentially last year, this time uh, of the year, pretty much. But we haven't seen that with V2 minis. And now, all of a sudden, SpaceX comes up with bandwagon missions, which go to similar orbits. They are not uh, the same as Starlink, but very similar mid-inclination orbits. So it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe it is because of this. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I mean, technically, there was that one rideshare ish ish mission the other week but that was with what we think are star shield satellites yeah so it kind of doesn't really count since it's just more starlink uh except for for the dod but that was what usa 350 and 351 if i remember correctly yep so yeah we'll also have to see if there are any more of those um star shield launches but as you can see that t minus 20 minute vent is over uh, so that means that liquid oxygen will now be being loaded onto the second stage. So, um, Sawyer, can you take us through some of the events coming up as we approach T0? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, as the second stage load is underway, uh, that is going to take about 14-ish minutes or so to completely finish filling that. Uh, in the meantime, the next big event that will be coming up is about seven minutes before launch when the rocket starts chilling down the nine Merlin 1D engines to prepare them for the thrust that they'll experience once the ignition happens. Uh, right after that, we should see uh, the transporter erector in about four and a half minutes start to retract away. That's the large white structure off to the side that also kind of has the clamps that end up around underneath the fairing. That'll go back about 1.8 degrees, and don't worry, it will throw all the way back away uh, before the actual liftoff time. Uh, and from there, it's a matter of finishing off all of the propellant loads and everything leading up to the T minus one minute mark, which is when it gets really exciting. That is when the onboard computers take control of the flight, meaning Falcon 9 enters startup. That's also when they pressurize all of the tanks to flight pressure. 
uh, T minus 45 seconds. We should get that go for launch, followed by engine ignition at T minus three seconds with the help of the T TED. It's a green flashed triethyl aluminum triethyl borate, followed by liftoff at hopefully T zero. Yeah, hopefully indeed. Um... With that, let me just go over a little bit more support real quick. Apoc Apocalypse Cow, a regular on our streams, gifted 10 red team memberships, and then, a few minutes later, gifted 10 more. So thank you very much, Apocalypse Cow. Um, James became a Pad Red member. Uh, me, 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 me became, or gifted a red team membership. Uh, and then uh, said, the SPMT troll, you make rockets unstand out. I do not understand the context of that, but... Uh, thank you for your support. Um, and then Steve is saying, we didn't win the billion dollar Powerball, but still want to support you all. What would you do with a billion dollar win? Oh man, I cannot even begin to imagine the things that DOS and the livestream team would be capable of with that amount of money. Um, but yeah, that would, that would be awesome. Um, the Ninja with the $5 super chat saying, Stubby bad, just want to stir the pot again. Thanks for all you guys do. I agree. I saw a very, very biased poll in chat earlier asking if Stubby or the regular nozzle is better, except it, the options were I prefer the regular nozzle and have no friends or something like that. So um, I, I did not approve of that poll. So I'm assuming it was Kevin. Shame on you, Kevin. Um... <laughs> <laughs> he likes ship 26 which is like yeah no yeah he doesn't so, dictate that julia here's one for you since you guys have a lot of boosters out on that coast lukewarm milk is wondering since spacex has so many boosters will they ever send them to be put on display Ooh, that's a good question and some of our um kind of historical boosters have been put on display do I foresee that really happening much going forward? Probably not. Um, and I say that because 1058 actually was scheduled to be expended on its 20th flight, although it didn't quite make it to that flight due to um, some rough seas coming back to Cape. Uh, so on that note, I think SpaceX is going to use these boosters as long as they can, and then their final mission will be kind of a tributary mission uh, where they'll they'll just expend the booster. Yeah, but like you were saying, well, I think the Cape has, what is it, B-1023 on display, one of the Falcon Heavy side cores, and then there's obviously B-1019 in Hawthorne, I think B-1035 in Texas, and then there's one in Colorado, actually right by me, uh, or near oh, and, me. And that's um, the one near and dear to my heart. That's 1021. That's the first, the first launch and landed one. booster. First reused, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I realized that. I don't think I actually knew that it was B1021. It that is, is the, yeah. Okay, That's the first I... reused booster. Yep, yeah, the it, folks in Discord, Colorado. if you <laughs> if you have me um, on Discord, you can actually see that very same booster right in the background of my profile picture. Um, wonderful. My favorite bo booster. Okay, now it's just pathetic that I haven't done the hour drive or whatever to go see it. I'm going to need to do that. Do oh, it. That is, that's Ryan's assignment before the next stream. Go see a booster. Well, I've seen 1019 uh, and the ones at the Cape. So I have seen a booster, just not 21. Okay. I'll add that to my to-do list. Um... Here's a good question for you, Alex. 98 Central is wondering, do Falcon 9 missions use Starlink like Starship? And what I think they're alluding to is we saw on the Starship Flight 4, they did a lot of video uh, throughput through the Starlink network. Are there any dishes on any of the Starlink stages or any of the Falcon stages to transmit through Starlink? Well, they don't have a a Starlink terminal or anything like it on Falcon 9, but they might in the future. So right now, all of the video and telemetry is downloaded through the usual, uh, I think it's K-band what they use, 
for for that uh essentially antennas that, that are used to to be able to transmit to ground stations but they don't use starlink on the rocket itself for example on the drone ships we know that they use those we've seen the terminals on those as well and so we get that that signal through starlink but while that is the, the the case right now that we don't have any starlinks you know the terminal not the satellite on falcon 9 on the other hand, they have filed uh, documentation to be able to have that in the future. We don't know when that'll be, or even if we will know when they actually fly with those, but those are going to be on Starlink missions, uh, so that most definitely not this one, um, just because of how they are allowed to, to use these, these missions, uh, these, these terminals and everything while they're flying Falcon 9 and everything. So we know it's not this mission, but, you know, Maybe there's some Starlink mission that has already used that. We don't really know. We, the The only way I think is probably going to be uh, if SpaceX actually says, "Hey, we're using Starlink on this mission," but that's essentially how 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 it is. We don't get. Uh, and and also I should say when that when that happens, if that happens, and if we actually know when it happens, that is going to be with a second stage, the Falcon 9 first stage. I think they didn't file any documentation. I've looked through and I haven't seen any documentation for the first stage to have the terminals. So that that will only be with the second stage. Yeah, and that actually reminds me, there was an interesting tweet earlier today from Jared Isaacman who posted that uh, on Polaris this summer, they're going to live stream the EVA and the Starlink demos. So they're going to um, attempt to use Starlink on that mission uh, to on help with community. Yeah, on Dragon, which will not Falcon, but uh, similar data, I suspect, will be gathered. So that'll be really exciting. And I don't know, my I feel pretty good about it uh, with how well Starlink yeah. worked on Starship. And people underestimate how complicated it is to, you know, to like beam between uh, a thing that is in orbit and and other stuff that is in orbit like it's really complicated the way that that they need to do all of that but they can do that so that's that's impressive and it gives a lot of data <laughs> and video live video th through re-entry that was awesome with the starship hopefully we see the whole thing with with ship 29 on on flight four but anyways back to falcon <laughs> <laughs> yeah that mission is going to be so crazy i know jared said that the suit unveil is sooner than later uh, unfortunately didn't give an exact date but uh, we'll definitely talk about that and i'm sure it'll be in twists uh, when it happens um you know it yeah what is an in twist uh jerwa with another ten dollar super chat saying hashtag stubby fan club efficiency greater than aesthetics yeah but it just it looks so bad also it's technically less efficient so, from an ISP perspective. Uh, and then Rusty became a PadRad member. Um, anyway, I see a question in chat since we keep talking about the stubby nozzle from Sonia. Wondering, can you please explain the stubby nozzle? So, Julia, what is the stubby nozzle all about? What is the stubby nozzle all about? Well, uh, the stubby nozzle is about a poll that we do in our chat that doesn't always seem to go Max's way. And Max <laughs> isn't here today, so uh, we can talk a little smack about that. Technically, though, in all honesty, I'm going to throw that question over to Alex because uh, technically I am not the best one to speak on that one. Yeah, well, the, <laughs> the, the stubby nozzle, so the MVAC engine on the second stage, the Merlin back you mentioned there, it has an extension to it. And that extension, if you don't need that, that, that extension, what it does is it increases the performance that you can extract out of that rocket uh, engine because as you go into the vacuum of the space, the exhaust expands. And if you have a, a larger nozzle, what that means is that you can essentially, there you go, the difference between both, you can essentially take more advantage of that expansion of the of the exhaust and therefore uh, take up more of that performance. But if you don't need the performance and you can essentially uh, you know, save money, 
uh, what you can do is cut that, that nozzle extension because that nozzle extension is made of niobium, which is not a very common metal out there. And it is also very hard to make because if you think about that, that is a roughly three meter wide nozzle. And it's a very big nozzle. It, you know, the, the manufacturing of it is also very complicated. So if you can cut costs and, and like time to manufacture it, then uh, you're saving time, you're saving money. That's good for your mission and you don't need the performance, then you can put it on your on your MVAC engine. So that is essentially the difference. We expect today's missions to, to carry that. I wouldn't be surprised also if they were to go with a regular nozzle as well, because you know maybe they have some regular nozzle uh, hanging around. We'll see. We'll find out in five minutes, <laughs> two minutes into flight. We'll we'll see probably something like that. Yeah, but with that, yeah. we have to let Julia and Sawyer go. They have to go. Sawyer's taking some amazing f photos, hopefully, of launch, and Julia will be bringing us live views of landing from her awesome location. So enjoy the launch. See you in a couple of minutes. Sounds good. All right. So, Alex, three minutes out from launch, what are some of the key milestones that are going on at this point? Yeah, so right now the Stromback is retracting. As you can see there now, that white structure next to the rocket is a little bit farther away from the rocket. It has already positioned itself for that engine ignition at T minus three seconds. And so right now, the RP-1 load has been completed on the first stage. They are uh, undergoing engine chill on those nine Merlin engines on the first stage. Liquid oxygen load is wrapping up on the first stage as well. And later, in about a minute, we'll see the wrap up of the liquid oxygen load on the second stage, which, and, and I just heard stage one looks is complete, so we are now with the first stage fully loaded with propellants, second stage will take another uh, 45 seconds or so. And then what we're gonna see is the vent on the Stromback coming back, and that'll be the start of the gas closeouts, essentially when they vent out all of the, the remaining propellant on the lines and, and things like that. Um, at T-minus one minute, the ground computers will hand over control to the onboard computers on Falcon 9, and we're gonna have um, you know, the final go for launch a few seconds later. So hopefully we're going to see from here the engines igniting at T minus three seconds and then lift off at T zero. Yeah, indeed. And just as a reminder to everyone, uh, we are not, well, we know for sure we will not be having any stage two views today from SpaceX. Uh, so we will just be tracking stage one. And there's that vent that Alex was talking about. Um, so... That's kind of exciting because in some ways that means we should have continuous coverage of just the booster, which sometimes makes us or allows yeah. for us to have amazing views. So um, that is uh, stage two lux load has completed. Yeah, I'm just looking now. It looks like that active fairing half has seen a couple of flights. It looks pretty darn sooty. Um, the active one, for those who may be wondering, is the one that faces the transport director and the passive faces away, which we cannot get a good view of from this angle. Uh, but with that, Falcon 9 should have entered startup coming up on the launch director's go for launch call. Mm -hmm. Any second now. <laughs> with that, about... 35 seconds from launch so as alex is talking about the key milestones to look for is at the base of the rocket startup. uh so okay it looks like our clock is a little bit off see um, this is the problem when spacex doesn't release the t-zero co completely exactly <laughs> yeah so we're adjusting that clock as you speak and go for launch and there's that go for launch so now uh pay attention to the base of the vehicle um, the key sign will be a green flash, that is that T-TEB coming in contact with liquid oxygen, which will start all nine of those engines. Uh, the booster will then check the health of the entire rocket, and if everything looks healthy, it will command those launch hold-down clamps to release the vehicle. There and there go. we have it. And there is liftoff of SpaceX's first bandwagon mission, carrying 11 satellites to low Earth orbit. We'll stay quiet here for a few seconds so you guys can enjoy the launch audio.
And there we go. That looks like a successful liftoff of this mission. The vehicle will now have passed through max Q, which is the moment of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. So that's as you the vehicle increases in velocity, um, the pressure builds up more, but then as it gets higher in the atmosphere, the uh, pressure decreases. So you have these two lines that intersect at the point that is known as max Q. But with that, we are coming up in about 40 seconds on stage separation and ignition of second stage. Alex, can you walk us through what we're about to see? Yeah, so this will be a very active process where they're going to shut down the engines on the first stage. The stages will separate for pushers will, active, will activate on the interest stage to push away the second stage. The MVAC engine on the second stage will ignite. Meanwhile, the first stage will flip back and start the boost back burn to return back to the Cape for a landing at landing zone one. So stay tuned for that in just a few seconds. Yeah, and to get back to landing zone one, it will be completing three burns. And there is the completion Nico? of first stage burn. Just a reminder, we will not be getting any views from SpaceX about stage two, but we will continue to track it. So now you can see the vehicle is in two parts, um, it looks like, and there is that uh, boost back burn. So you can see on the left, uh, kind of above, there is the first stage coming back to LZ1, and then lower down is the second stage continuing on to orbit. Um, any second now, we don't have an exact time, uh, SpaceX will be deploying those two payload fairing halves. Uh, and as Sawyer mentioned earlier, those will be recovered from uh, the ocean water. And there we have views of those three Merlin engines firing on the first stage for boost back burn. So Alex, what... Uh, what are those three burns we're expecting on the first stage, first of which is happening right now? Yeah, so this is the boost back burn. It is essentially igniting three engines to come back to to shore. Then um, it'll coast for about a few minutes, and then it'll go through the through the reentry phase. That'll be uh, when it ignites again the engines to do the entry burn, and and then a last burn once closer. There you go. That's the shutdown of the boost back burn. Now it'll coast, it'll use those RCS thrusters that you can see firing and position itself engines first for the re-entry. Then again, as I was saying, an entry burn and then a landing burn, which will bring it down to, to the landing side, of course. Then you can see those grid fins deploying, all going very nominally. It's always cool to, to see things going, you know, this way. Yeah, man, I always love the views of the RCS puffs during this section of uh, RTLS missions. So satisfying to watch. But as you can see on the right hand uh, display, all four of those grid fins have now been deployed uh, for these RTLS missions. Those are deployed uh, after the boost back burn, uh, unlike on uh, ASDS missions where they're deployed immediately after uh, stage separation. Landing is expected at approximately T plus seven and a half minutes, um, and the first stage entry burn will start at T plus five minutes and 49 seconds, uh, so in about you know 30 seconds, give or take. Uh, as a reminder, those the exact times that SpaceX has in their press kit are not always uh, accurate and that's because this is not a pre-programmed landing. This is the booster is looking at its own telemetry to figure out when it needs to start that burn and when that burn needs to be um, finished with. So that's why sometimes the actual burn length varies sometimes even substantially from uh, the published burn time that SpaceX has. And then you can see on the right now, that's the inner stage, that's the central pusher uh, that Falcon 9 uses for stage separation. Yeah, and a lot of people think that that's the only pusher. It has actually another three that are... This is actually a secondary pusher that they have to be able to... Because when, when they upgraded to the V1.2 version of, of Falcon 9, they increased the size of the of the MVAC engine, so it's, it's more complicated to separate the stages when you have such a big nozzle. So to keep it on track, that pusher uh, allows them to 
you know, to not have the nozzle hit the, the interest stage. That is an important thing. We don't want um, that kind of uh, failure happening on, on the MVAC engine. But then you can see it is re-entering rather quickly. The altitude is going down. Speed is going up. We're yeah. going to see that entry burn really shortly. Oh, yeah. Today, SpaceX's entry burn published timeline was way off. They say 549, and it looks like it's more like T plus 6 minutes and 25 seconds or so. So this will, again, be with just a oh, single there we go. engine. That's the entry burn. And Alex, this is just a single engine on these RTLS. Mi oh, no, that was a 131. Three. Yeah, that's 3-1. Yeah. 131. Okay. So then for landing, are we expecting 131 or just one? I'm expecting only one. They don't need the performance. Look at that. Look at how look how fast it comes down and like it's a bit out of focus, I guess, but it is also like you can see it is essentially gliding down to the to the pad yeah everyone who i've talked to has who's witnessed an rtls landing that always angle like, yeah wow. they always say that Ooh. it looks like it's a failed landing when you're seeing it in person because of how late that engine ignites and that engine should be igniting any second here and you can see like alex was alluding to it is highly angled oh, there and we there go. is that uh, single engine for landing. So now the booster is rapidly decelerating to hopefully land on LZ1. I believe it is the first landing here because it did RTLS before, but it was landing on two. There you go. And there Landed. we go. SpaceX really makes that look so easy. That was their 220th consecutive booster landing and 294th total. Also at this time, Stage 2 should have shut down its engine, um, or it looks like they're just about to. But of course, we unfortunately don't have any uh, telemetry or live views from that provided by SpaceX. But wow, those RTLS missions, they really never get old, do they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that was all Julia's tracking. So Julia, fantastic work. Um, when she's back, we'll have to ask her how that was. Um, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> she's back. <laughs> I'm back. You guys, that was so amazing. Um, it helps when we have nice, clear blue skies to follow that down, but you are not kidding about how fast it comes down, and that angle is absolutely insane. And then coming to uh, straightening out for landing. And that angle also serves a purpose in case we do need to do a water abort. So we've seen that in the past, and it was a beautiful landing. Yeah, so that was what, CRS-16, where the engine didn't ignite they lost uh control of the vehicle and so when the engine ignited uh it performed a splashdown in the uh just right off the coast as opposed to uh coming into the landing zone so that's an intentional safety mechanism as julia was uh, talking about but yeah julia how is the launch um if julia is around she may be busy or talking while muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I had folks around me. Can we repeat the question? No, how was launch? Um, launch was absolutely beautiful. So my brain is out of perspective. Uh, I can see the pad to what is the far left of, of my view. And with it going northeast, I was honestly expecting it to go a little bit more to the left. So uh, it kind of came center. And... Happy to say that landing was pretty much where I predicted in my mind it would be, which made it a heck of a lot easier to catch. Um, and I know my cameras are clear, but I am going to do one more view for you all, and you can see kind of those clouds that happen after a launch, and maybe we'll get some pretty views of that and continues to set. Awesome. <laughs> and Sawyer, do we have you back? We do have you back. 
Hello, I am back. How was it? Did you get some awesome photos? Uh, especially of the landing. I mean, this one, I don't know why this sonic boom felt so much louder than usual, but it, everything today felt very, I guess, percussive, if that makes sense. The bass hit hard. It's like someone was slapping the bass as it was going up. You really felt this one. It was, it was great. Gorgeously clear skies. You could see it pretty much the whole way down. And a lot of people cl happy and clapping until they got startled by the sonic booms. <laughs> awesome. And the important question, did the VAB squeal? If a VAB squeals and no one's around to hear it, did it actually? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a jetty. I'm away from the VAB. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true. I guess here, none of you are on the press site. So, yeah, very cool. Well, we will have some replays. Uh, coming up here in a sec, but until those are ready, let's answer, or actually, let's go through a little bit more support. Uh, Rusty became a Pad Red member. Ryan uh, gifted 20 Red Team memberships. Um, the Gaming Easter Bunny gifted a Red Team membership. And then Ryan became a Pad Red member. So thank you all very much for that support. Thank you everyone for just tuning in and liking the live stream. It really does allow us to do what we love to do. Um, the Nozzle also uh, gifted a Red Team membership. Uh, then Vins in a super chat is wondering, on earlier missions with the full-size vacuum engine, it seemed like the ring, um, it seemed to have a ring that kept the end stable and then fell off. In the last few missions, I haven't seen this. Yeah, so Alex, what happened to that ring stiffener? What's the point and uh, why do we think it's been removed? Yeah, it it definitely has been removed in in the last few missions, uh, at least for uh, for certain missions that are not like NASA or or any government. We'll, we'll see if we get to that point um, to a government mission. But essentially, that that is stiffer. What it did is, as the, the the name mentions, it just stiffens the the end of the nozzle. It's a very thin niobium material, so what what happened is that they they had this sort of thinking that it could break with the vibrations during the launch and everything uh when, when you have such a thin material so that's why they had the the uh the stiffener ring so that it could m maintain consistency and then when they ignite the engine the the glue the the, the adhesive that they have for the for the um for the stiffener ring it just uh essentially you know, uh, it, it just melts away because of the heat of the engine, and so the stiffener ring just pops off as as it should because of of that heat. And so that is essentially uh, what it is for. Now, what might happen is that what they have found is that you know it increases the risk of, of breaking the nozzle, but it just it's like very very slightly, and therefore for stalic missions, for example, they can take that risk. And also, uh, we recently we recently saw that as well on Utilsat 3060, which is a customer mission, but it is a commercial customer, right? It's not a government customer. So perhaps also for commercial customers, they can take that sort of risk because it doesn't increase that much the amount of risk, or maybe they're just completely facing it out. And we're starting to see that also in commercial flights, and then eventually com government flights will also um, remove that. But we'll see. Indeed. And then real quick, I guess while we're doing, or since sound's about to hit, we will listen to the sound and then go to our final question. I always Forgot love seeing the yeah, I love seeing the vapor and the exhaust just slowly disappear from those static shots. And as Alex was saying, um, obviously the mission is not over yet, but this will be SpaceX's 300th consecutive mission success.
at least orbital flight. If you count in-flight abort test, okay. But, you know, the second stage didn't do anything other than be a mass simulator kind of thing, <laughs> being loaded with propellants and, and that was it. But, yeah, if you count only orbital missions, then this will be the 300th from, you know, ever since AMO 6 happened, that will be 300. Yeah, it's worth noting, though, that that IFA flight was fully successful. It just wasn't mm -hmm. targeting orbit, and it didn't even have a Merlin engine on it. Um, so. Yep. Let's see. I'm not sure, Julia and or Sawyer, do we have either of you here? I'm editing a picture, but I'm here. What's the question? Uh, Steve is wondering, what camera and lens did you use tonight? Uh, I'm a Nikon guy. I I'm one of the few here at NSF that is. Uh, I use a Nikon D810, and this was with a 5500 lens. I also have my D7500 out with a 1024 wide angle lens going for a street shot with an ND filter. Awesome. I'm sure to some people that made absolutely no sense, but for those who know, now you know. Yeah, I certainly have no idea what that means. <laughs> but I hope you got some cool pegs. Um, anyway, uh, it seems like we have landing from... This is Julia's angle now. So now you can really just see how crazy late and how quickly the booster comes in for landing on landing zone 1. Let's see. Alex, do you think these RTLS missions will ever get old? I don't think so. This is the 40th landing on LC1, so it's very young. <laughs> it, it's been ver barely used. <laughs> Needs more landings. Just to put in perspective, uh, a shuffle of Gravitas is like the youngest of the drone ships, and it has already seen 64 landings on it, so it needs more landings. We need more RTLS. <laughs> yeah, hey, at least it's not like LZ2, which is what, like five or six landings? <laughs> uh, a little bit more. Um, Ten landings in has scene. It's actually more than I thought. My spreadsheet, it broke how counting landings on LZ1, and I don't really care enough to fix it since I'm trying to move everything away from that. But there, there you, you can, can see, see that landing burn. Yep, that landing burn. This is the old uh, RTLS landing configuration, where on some of the newer or, or more performance missions, uh, like crewed missions, the landing profile is a single engine entry burn and then a 131 landing. But since they had so much spare performance today, they elected to go for this older uh, profile yeah. where they had a longer entry burn of uh, three engines and then just the one engine for landing. You can actually see there on, on Julia's shot, that landing burn actually started rather high up <laughs> compared to the one that is uh, 131, uh, like the entry burn. Yeah, that, that, that other one ignites much, much closer to the ground. Oh, there we yeah. go. See, you can see there, it takes a while for the rocket to reach the ground. The other one is like 20 seconds long. I think this is Land an extra free. 10 more. What? Did Sawyer say something? I think Sawyer tried to say something. Yeah, some pun, probably, because it's Sawyer. I totally forgot it, sorry. Continue. Oh my gosh. Maybe that's for the better, though. <laughs> and Look at that. we have this awesome photo from Julia of launch. Um. I always love these like crowd shots with the rocket in the background. Wow. Great shot, Julia. Great tracking and all that. Thank you so much. It was a joy to come out today. Yeah. Um, and then Sawyer, thank you very much for being out in the field as well. 
taking some photos, which I'm sure you will post on your X account. So make sure everyone goes check, go and check out Sawyer and Julia on X, and of course at NASA Space Flight. Um, we'll possibly retweet those as well. Thanks. I was trying to get you a quick picture here, but uh, a lot of people around means slower on the. But you will have one. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Um, and then, Alex, thank you very much for being on stream today. It's always a pleasure. And as you can see there, the Strombach has already gone vertical. That is because it needs to get ready for the next launch from 39A. That'll be Starlink uh, 649. That'll be in about five days from now. So look out for that. Because uh, we're obviously going to be covering that. We cover... Uh, uh, or at least we try to cover all the launches that we can from, from the Cape, sometimes with a little bit of a different team as today, for example, with Julia and Sawyer, because Max and D are out to, you know, uh, chase the eclipse tomorrow. We'll obviously go, go live as well for that. But before that launch from here, from 39A, we're going to have another two uh, uh, launches from the Cape. One of them is the Delta for Heavy on Tuesday. And later that night, we're going to have a Falcon 9 from Sleek 40. So tune in because we're going to cover all of those. The clips, the two launches, the other launch later in the week. We're here for everything. <laughs> yeah, Alex just stole what I was going to say, but our coverage for the... I always plug everything. I like it. <laughs> total solar eclipse tomorrow so will so start at noon Eastern. Uh, so if you're interested in that, we'll be live that whole time. Make sure you tune in. Um, but with that, I also want to thank Ryan in the background for operating today's stream. And then one last piece of support, uh, Steve with $5 super testing. I think the stiffener rings to prevent the nozzle on hitting the inner stage on early nozzles. They update the nozzle to eliminate the FOD. Um, yeah, I think it was more for preventing vibrations, but um, good theory. I, it would be interesting to get official confirmation from SpaceX of why that was removed. But anyway. Thank you everyone very much for tuning in today, for those who super chatted, and for liking. We will see you in tomorrow's Solar Eclipse stream. Thanks everyone, have a good one. And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up.